to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Today is October 12th, 2017, and you're listening to our third and maybe final, who knows, we might do one tomorrow, I don't know, uh, a bonus episode of Human Factors Cast live from HFES in Austin, Texas. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorf. Oh man, three days in a row of HFES podcast. Nick, I am loving it. Oh man, there's so much content here to go over, but we're not alone this week, or I guess today. We're, we're not alone today. We have Logan Clark, who is one of our listeners here. Uh, he is from University of Central Florida, and he's here to talk about uh, one of his experiences that he has been uh, experiencing here at HFES. Logan, how are you? I am doing great, guys. How are you doing tonight? Excellent. So good. This Thanks for coming Factors, on the show, man. Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, day three. Um, so, Logan... You and I met in the hallway, and uh, I'm so glad to finally have you on the show. We've we've been talking back and forth for a little bit, uh, but you went to the Toyota factory tour yesterday. Yes, I did. It was incredibly cool. It was one of the coolest things I've actually seen um, while I'm here. Um, so actually, every year, HFES hosts these, um, these tours of cool human factors related sites near the meeting, so just things that might be interesting to... Um, we human factors nerds. Um, and this year, actually, they ended up heading over to the Toyota manufacturing plant in San Antonio. So I took the opportunity, hopped on a bus. It was interestingly enough, it was an hour and a half drive over and the air conditioning broke, which oh, I was no. a little, yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting. But thankfully, a couple of the passengers in the front of the bus were actually able to get it working. I guess that's the benefit of having a bus full of engineers and human factors guys. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. I love that, you know, we, we're a bunch of problem solvers and that we can fix something like even something like air conditioning on a, on a long bus ride. So, yeah. Logan, why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and take us through kind of chronologically what, what happened while you were on this tour? Love to hear about it. Sure. Um, so when we arrived, they actually took us to a visitor center. Um, it was this sort of opening area where I, get, I sort of got the sense that that's sort of where they just leave the tourists um, they put us through an information session, went over all the rules. It's basically your standard Disney stuff, hands and feet inside the car at all times, wear your seatbelt, don't dive out of the car in oncoming traffic. Basically just the usual um, Disney stuff, but they actually didn't let us take pictures. Um, and that's why we actually have the, a link of a, a journalist who is actually allowed to take pictures. Um, and we actually have those in... We have those in the show notes, too, so any listeners who are interested, you can you can follow along with those. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, it was really, I was actually very sad that they wouldn't let us take pictures looking back, just because some of the stuff we saw in this place, um, it was, it's basically a human factor's dream meets a sci-fi utopia. So the first thing we saw, we got on this sort of trolley, um, this sort of trolley thing, and we turned a corner and ended up having to stop because there was there were some materials coming in front of us. And I was actually really glad we stopped because I got to watch this woman go through several cycles of using this handheld claw. And it looked almost like an industrial sized pooper scooper, like what you'd use to pick up after your dog. Um, sure, sure. But, but she was using it to lift these massive pieces of piping. It looked like it might be like a mufflers or an exhaust pipe or something like that. And she was lifting them out of storage containers and picking them up and carrying them probably 10 feet over and setting them down into, into a transportation cart that would take them to other parts of the factory. But the crazy thing was, at first, I didn't see what this chain was, what this, this hook was connected to. And I was kind of wondering, like, how is she doing this? She has to be incredibly strong. But it turns out the claw is actually attached to a chain that goes up to a winch in the ceiling that's mounted to sort of a, a superstructure that lets the lets the chain move freely. So as she moves around in her workspace, all of the vertical mov um, movement of what she's carrying is actually taken care of by this machine. She pushes up and down buttons on the handle, and it allows her to move these massive, probably 200-pound hunks of pipe absolutely effortlessly. It was it was just beautiful seeing humans and machines working together so so flawlessly like that yeah so it sounds like she had a lot of automation going um yes, helping her out 
do this whole process or was it was it not automated was it kind of just one for one um control where she was just pressing the controls and it was doing what i was i i have to admit i kind of i believe i may have broken the rule of staying inside the vehicle i was leaning out to try to see what her hand was doing on the control but i'm pretty sure she had basically an up down uh, an up button and a down button built into her handle which allowed her to move to um, direct the movement of the wench up and down. Huh. Um, so, so you saw this thing, and then what was what came next? So, so you stopped, and then did you? How long did were you there? And then what happened afterwards? So we were probably there maybe ten seconds. It was just long enough um, because there are these interesting, and this is actually the next piece that was absolutely fascinating, and I actually. Um, had to sort of, I sort of exchanged looks with a few of the people on the tram because they were as surprised as I was to see these. There are these, there's an entire fleet of these mini autonomous robots, these little autonomous vehicles that they use to deliver parts around the factory. And a whole, a little fleet of these was actually passing in front of us. That's why we had to stop. Um, they're sort of these little, they're almost like skateboards, except they have the, the Toyota logo on them. You can actually see the links in the um, the picture and the link in the show notes. There are, it, 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 they move autonomously throughout the factory on tracks that are actually embedded beneath the their lanes, and it it was really cool to see them move around. And they, it, it's it, it was almost it was almost like seeing it was almost like being on board the Death Star. I guess that's the only way I could describe it. <laughs> Wow, I oh, mean that man, sounds like between you know <laughs> that sounds like a model of efficiency being Toyota. I mean, just between what you're describing with the claw that basically allowed allowed a human to lift a weight that's far beyond what they're able to normally, and now having just automated robots, I guess, or tools in this case, running around being able to deliver parts. That's pretty cool already. Yes, and I actually asked the. Um, tour guide afterwards how do those things work and what directs their movement and it turns out toyota uses this whole um this whole system called pull production where they only manufacture a particular number of vehicles to meet exactly the demand that's in the market and it turns out that every single one of those parts is actually individually selected to be a part of a particular vehicle that they're building and they track each of the parts of each vehicle through the factory and make sure that they all converge on the line at exactly the right moment. Wow. That is, that's really impressive. I'm, I'm really impressed right now. Uh, even just from your, uh, your sort of recap here. So, so uh, what happened next? So beyond that, um, we actually passed those all along those little vehicles all along the way at one point we actually had to turn left across the lane where there were a bunch of them coming through and they actually somehow noticed that our vehicle was coming they made a break for our tram to turn through they stopped and they, there was sort of a line of them back um about probably about three or four deep they let us come they let our tram pull through and then they just continued on their way i i was fascinated by that because i was actually waiting to see what would happen when we had to turn across oh but wow on the so way- they're they're not just um, like running on tracks. They've actually got some sensing systems. It sounds like to pick out larger objects in their field of view. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. They actually, I don't know exactly what type of sensors they had, but whatever they were, they were incredibly effective because it wasn't just something where we pulled in front of them and then they came to a grinding halt. They somehow noticed that our vehicle was approaching, slowed down and actually came to a smooth stop right before where we would, would be turning. So I'm, I don't know if that was something that was programmed in beforehand, but regardless, it was very cool. Again, it felt like I was watching the Death Star being built um, by, a, by a sort of like a team of drones almost. Well, well, now you're almost making me jealous that I had to chair this session during <laughs> this this uh, tour. Yeah, it was... It sounds it like was, some- Sorry, go ahead. So, oh, I was just saying, it sounds really cool. So, so, uh, so they came to a halt. What happened next? Um, we actually turned left and came up on this massive robotic arm. Found out afterwards they actually call this thing Godzilla. It's probably about, <laughs> t- yeah, it's very aptly named. It was probably about 20 or so feet tall, maybe taller. It was hard to gauge from the distance we were at. But the job of this robot, it's fully autonomous. 
it runs on a, an algorithm and they don't touch it except to do maintenance. It reaches up about, uh, I'd say maybe 20 feet in the air up to the second level and grabs truck cabs, the, the entire truck cab, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 pounds, just picks it up like a tinker toy and lowers it down and sets it onto the conveyor belt for the, the main assembly line. Now I can kind of picture those from commercials from Toyota. I think I know what you're talking about, these giant arms that do that stuff. Do, do you happen to know if that's like if that's operator run or is that one of these pieces of machinery that are built to kind of operate in their own parameters? Well, I believe some of the, the smaller ones, the welding robots, are monitored directly by humans. I'm not entirely sure. But this particular robot, they actually emphasize the fact that it's fully autonomous. Wow, that's amazing. Toyota is just obviously doing some really cool stuff inside of their actual factory plants. I mean, between this different kinds of automation, like across, it sounds like just different robots. That's just really cool. Oh, yeah. All right, so keep... Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I couldn't help but imagine, as I was watching this thing and how powerful it was, how gracefully it moved, like, just that degree of power, it almost made me feel like what would happen if someone took a system like this and used it for evil instead of for making cars? Maybe that's just the nerd in me. <laughs> oh, the Empire can make some truly magnificent marvels. But, okay, so keep walking us through through the process here. So so uh, you, you turn the left, you saw this machine, fully autonomous machine, putting the uh, chassis on the, or sorry, putting the shells on the chassis, and then what, what happened next? Um, from there, the biggest um, human factors related pieces that I thought were really interesting were actually the human side of things. Um, from there on out, the vehicles have been um, the vehicles go into painting and we actually unfortunately weren't able to go through the paint shop because they have exacting specifications related to making sure that no hairs, no fibers, nothing and any could in any way contaminate their paint jobs. So unfortunately, we weren't able to go through and see the vehicles actually being painted. But we went to the other side of the where they come out of the paint shop. And that's where we got to see the entire interior of the car being put together. So the shells have already been lowered down onto this assembly line. And then it's sort of almost like an elongated U shape. It goes down what the vehicles travel down one way at a snail's pace and then turn around and actually travel back the other way. And there are workers along those conveyor belts performing a whole series of tasks. Every one, according to the tour guide at least, they have to be able to complete it in between 55 and 60 seconds. So each of them spends months training, months of, for some actually bordering on years, training to get, basically become a master of their task and get to the point where they are absolute, the humans are almost machines, just the efficiency that they're functioning with. But the cool, the really cool piece from a human factors perspective that I thought was, in, was particularly interesting was this cord that they have, this line, they have a Japanese name for it, but this line that runs all the way along the assembly line. It's a big white cord, easy to see, and it's actually connected to a speaker and a light. And whenever any of the employees at any point sees something that looks abnormal or they have a tool malfunction or some, there's some sort of defect that has made it to their station from earlier up the line, they're actually encouraged and required to pull that line. And that stops the assembly line and actually alerts the engineering team that there's something going wrong. And then the engineers just swarm in to fix the problem and then get it going again. Did you did you actually get to witness this? Someone pulling this line, or was it just kind of verbal, verbally stated, and not not really anything else? Unfortunately, I did not get to witness it. I was really hoping I would. They had one in the visitor center that they they had a demonstration, so you could pull it and see what happens when it gets pulled. But this the concept of them being able to stop the line whenever they want, correct the error, and then continue rather than having an, it, uh, it's almost an industrial organizational issue when a company prioritizes getting the work done and keeping the line moving over getting the work done the right way. And that's what I thought was really interesting is that they empower their workers to make sure that the work gets done the right way instead of just keeping it moving. 
Yeah, for sure. That sounds like it. So was that the end of the tour then? Was this last U-shaped area or was there a little bit more? It was pretty close. Um, They took us by their on-site training area. They have miniaturized versions of basically every task that the workers perform along that line to give them an opportunity to work on them in an environment where it's not going to be placing the the safety or the efficiency of the product in jeopardy. And also they they have to meet particular specified times. Um, But the other piece, and this wasn't even something that was built into the factory, it was just something that I found interesting about the company's philosophy is that they use this sort of crowdsource redesign for their system. So anytime a worker who's become, by the time they're working there, they're basically an expert. By the time, anytime that a worker comes across something that they think can be done more efficiently or more effectively, or they develop a way that the system could function better, they're actually encouraged to bring that up to management. And instead of going around and looking for ways that they think it might uh, the system could be improved, their human factors team actually uses these recommendations from the workers and builds their their recommendations and their design investigations on that. That's really impressive to me because there's a lot of industry companies out there that will often have mechanisms for feedback, but they never act upon them to improve the processes and procedures under which the human operator is doing these tasks. And it's good to know that Toyota is out there kind of uh, ensuring that they are iteratively going through and making adjustments to this process to make it more easily accessible for their employees. That's that's awesome to me. Yes, and they actually showed us several they actually showed us several portions of the assembly line, several little they obviously wasn't big huge sections, but there were several little pieces where they said this task in particular was redesigned 2 years ago when one of the workers came up with a better way of, of, of doing it. So it was really interesting. But just in general, there was so much other cool stuff going on there. Um, anyone listening to the show who's interested in industrial engineering, industrial organizational psychology, um, or just human factors and technology in general, I definitely recommend checking out the link in the show notes and reading up on it. Yeah. So so that was the end of the tour then, after the uh, little sort of miniature area where they kind of showed the tasks? Yes, yeah, that was actually the end of the tour. They took us right back to where we started, and they, on the way out, they made sure that none of us were carrying phones or cameras or anything that could have possibly taken pictures. We actually had a member of our group who somehow misinterpreted the no phones rule, and he brought his phone with him but didn't take any pictures, so they pulled him aside, and I don't know what they did. I assume they wiped his phone or something. But uh, yeah, we, never, the, we never heard from him again. That's, that's he, what happened. He disappeared. They took him into a dark room, and we I, we never saw him again. Oh man! Well, Logan, I got I got to hand it to you, man. That that was an amazing recount of the uh, experience you had at the Toyota factory tour. Um, Blake, do you have any other uh, closing remarks or questions for Logan? I uh, no. It's just really interesting that obviously Toyota is very. I don't know, it's very ahead of its time, of course, looking at the efficiency models that they have with their workers, but also, obviously, from what Logan is saying, and thanks again for sharing this with us, but the autonomy that's running in their robots throughout the factory is sounds pretty incredible. Uh, and it's, it's great that they actually take so much feedback from workers and build it into their processes or technology, but, you know, Toyota's been known for doing that for years. I mean, they've come up with more managerial... Um, organizational structure of things that have been used across different companies within agile and all sorts of stuff. So they're, that's an awesome company. I wish I had gone to HFES just to go on this tour. So thanks for recapping Logan. My pleasure. Well, Blake, you know, there's always next year. I, I heard HFES 2018 will be in Philadelphia. So, um, Ooh, who knows? that's awesome. Yeah. Maybe you can, maybe you can join us next year and we're going to have a human factors live uh, Human Factors Cast live from from Philadelphia, uh, but so so just to kind of bring our listeners um, another sort of experience today. Uh, well, let me just back up. The reason we had Logan on the show today was because I'm a bad host and I couldn't attend. Yeah, okay. Let me just back up here. If you go to these conferences, you know that there are many networking opportunities. And when I say networking, I say them with air quotes because that means drinking. So 
<laughs> you go out and network with a bunch of your with a bunch of people that do work that is tangentially related to you and obviously you want to make connections. So that is what I did last night and because I networked very hard last night, I uh, didn't wake up until pretty late today, but that's okay because I was able to make it to one session. I made it to the investigations of virtual environment technology, and uh, that's a fancy name basically for – it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with augmented reality, at least in my opinion. Um, so let me kind of go through these one by one. We had augmented reality design heuristics. So the other day we kind of the, – the session I chaired, we kind of talked about the virtual reality design heuristics uh, brought to you by the researchers over at YouTube. And then today we kind of did the augmented reality side of things. And then there was also um, uh, task performance and situation awareness within virtual environments using HMDs, head-mounted displays. Then they talked about uh, effects of HoloLens in terms of collaboration and how that kind of helps navigation tasks or navigational tasks. And then last up, we had uh, the effects of 3D audio on on augmented reality. So lots of really interesting papers today. And honestly, like I know my bias is showing through, but the Virtual Environments Technical Group has really got it going on. They, they got a lot of really interesting projects. And I got to echo my statement from last night. I mean, there for every one thing you say yes to, you say no to seven other things. And there are a million other things that I wish I could go and watch and see. But you got you to gotta pick and choose where um, you, know, you find your interests. And so... It's just one of those things. So I'm I'm so sorry for the VR AR overload, folks. But that's just what I saw, and that's gonna be kind of what I have to report on. So <laughs> we'll just uh, we'll just go from there. Well, that's cool, Nick. I mean, so, do, are we gonna kind of break down each one of the pieces you saw, kind of like last night? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do have notes on all of them. So the first one up was uh, the design heuristics for augmented reality. And they kind of go over what is the best way to augment the physical world, right? They they put they pulled up the example of Pokemon Go. Um, you know, people were killed playing this game. It was a it was a social experiment for the lack of a better term. And they they really kind of looked at uh, you know how the users ignored safety, they ignored environmental concerns, they <laughs> trespassed all these things, right? So there, there is this need for augmented reality heuristics, right? So what the team um, from uh, bah, 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 where was a Draper, what they did was they kind of did this affinity diagram. They looked at a variety of existing heuristic analyses um, or heuristics where they, they – so they looked at the heuristics. They looked at statistical analyses within these heuristics, and they also looked at expert exam evaluations of uh, these heuristics and, and kind of looked at, a, um, you know, like video game heuristics, mobile heuristics, kind of the ones that we broke down last night, uh, design heuristics, usability heuristics. And they pulled out the ones that were applicable to augmented reality. If it was even tangentially related, they pulled it out. They did an affinity affinity diagram and kind of laid out, you know, these ones are this category and that one, those ones are those categories. And they came up with nine different heuristics. And I'm just going to kind of run through them. And we can kind of go through them one by one. And, uh, or I guess we can just go and, and if you have any comments or questions on them, um, we can talk about them in the moment. So the first one here is a fit with user environment and task, right? So the augmented reality has to be appropriate for whatever uh, the task is, and it has to be able to map onto the environment appropriately. The um, just, just jump in if you have any additional questions or anything like that. Yeah, so that's uh, kind of second... an interesting one. I mean, because uh, if you go back to the Pokemon Go example, part of the issue I, I would think with it, right, where people are ignoring their environment environment is it does really map pretty well onto the space you're in, no matter where you are. And and I mean the the task itself is self explanatory. I mean you're catching Pokemon, right? So I wonder how that heuristic plays into uh, adapting to some of the safety concerns that they mention. Yeah, you know, I think that's addressed in another one of these um 
heuristics here. But I agree with you where that heuristic was met for Pokemon Go. I mean, they, they were using the environments uh, and it mapped to the task. So let me get into the second one here. This one is a uh, form communicates function. And, you know, I didn't, they went through these kind of quick during the thing. And uh, really, I think what this one's getting at is that the information that you see on the augmented reality display should convey some sort of function for that display. Um, actually, we're running up pretty pretty close on time here. Let me let me just kind of jump through these, and and maybe we can address comments at the end. We got minimize distraction and overload, and that's the one that I think uh, I don't think Pokemon Go really took into a huge consideration. I think that that example uh, did not take into account distractions and overload because oh, yeah. you find people, yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of yeah, a yeah, difficult yeah. one to skirt, too, for them. Because, I mean, they, they did start, of course, with some of the tr more tragic events that surrounded people playing the game, getting hurt, and that kind of stuff. I mean, they, they tried their best to integrate that, just like textual alerts about that kind of stuff into it. But it's it's kind of hard, How do you? because how do you bound something in augmented reality if it's affecting your physical environment? And I, I doubt, or I, I feel like it would be a pretty intensive programming effort to understand the location to a point where it can like actively make changes about what's going on in the task or warn you about physical elements in your environment in addition to like creating an augmented piece on it as well i agree yeah so four we have adaptation to user position and motion so it just should be it should adapt to wherever you move to alignment of physical and virtual environment um works worlds man my chicken scratches I, i'm telling you uh so, so i think this is just you know making sure things map on appropriately you want to make sure it, phys uh, it fits with the user's physical abilities with the uh and then the next one is fit with the user's perceptual abilities you want to you don't want to give anything to them that they're not going to be able to do physically or mentally you also want to make it accessible for off-screen objects, right? So when you're using augmented reality, sometimes things go off-screen, and you want to make sure that they can get to those things easily. And we got we got another paper coming up here that um, actually plays nicely into that one. So we'll get to that one in just a minute. But the last one here is account for hardware capabilities. And there's a big push kind of between these, both the um, virtual reality and, and augmented reality, putting an emphasis on hardware capabilities. Oh, yeah. I mean, last night for going through the VR heuristics, I mean, the majority of those were all related to hardware issues or making sure that the hardware is appropriately appropriately made and where the cords are. So, I mean, I, I think that makes a lot more sense, especially for a focus in VR, seeing as you're wearing a headset. Uh, but w did you get any kind of sense of what they were talking about with regard to AR? In terms of the uh, for hardware. hardware capabilities? Yeah. I, th I think it's just the same kind of things that we were talking about last night. I don't, they, they didn't really go into it all that much, but just be aware that, you know, there are hardware limitations in terms of, you know, how, how comfortable the uh, headset is and, and what kind of um, technology is required of it. So like the battery life and, and, you know, the associated things like that. Very cool. Well, that's I'm stoked to see these heuristics coming out for these advances in technology like AR and VR. I think it's a really awesome step forward for people designing uh, like games, apps, everything in between. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Logan, do you have any other closing thoughts on that one before I move on to the next? I actually do. I actually attended, I believe it was during the same time as the AR panel or else I would have gone there, but I attended one. It was a very similar panel but it was talking about design heuristics for exoskeletons, which I feel like there, that could be an oh, entirely gotcha. different show. But they're actually calling for, right now, a revision of the original design heuristics. And part of the reason they were holding that particular session was to recruit ergonomists. It was in the during the occupational ergonomists um, subgroup. It was actually the purpose of the session was to recruit ergonomists to work on this issue and work on the panel to actually revise a set of heuristics because the technology of exoskeletons and exosuits is actually developing faster 
than the the design heuristics and the design rules governing it. Wow, that's interesting. So, so we'll probably see some sort of resurgence of of this uh, these heuristics. I see it's it's weird because we'll probably see one for each set of technologies, and I think there's value in that. But it's also like you want things you want heuristics to be something easily accessible. You don't want to have a set of heuristics for every subset of things. I don't know. I thought it was, I thought, you know, VR and AR at least are closely enough related to where you can kind of use the same set for both of them. And it's interesting that there's a lot of overlap. I'd be curious to see what kind of overlap there is as it comes to exoskeletons, right? Is, I mean, do they have a lot of hardware considerations in theirs as well? Well, from the majority, the majority of what I was seeing was related to hardware and also physiological elements. They didn't actually go through the heuristics individually. Uh, the panel was actually structured around having researchers from all over the, the spectrum of exos exosuit research. So they had someone there from the Army. They had someone there from one of the Navy yards. There were um, several other researchers who had been working independently. There was actually someone there from Boeing. So they were basically looking at the present state of research. The topic of the, the the overarching topic of the session was actually called exoskeletons. Are we ready for prime time yet? And it was basically looking at the present state of research and sort of making the argument that we need to take these design factors into account in, in order to move forward. But the, the main concerns that I saw were related to hardware, but specifically how that hardware interacts with the human user. So for powered exosuits, there's the, the question of heat, where if you have a motor running on someone's back that's controlling this exosuit, it's creating uncomfortable heat. But then there are also the issues of contact points, because if the exosuit's carrying your weight, it's contacting your body somewhere, and then that can cause undue strain on different parts of the body. It might be relieving pain in the back, but it's putting extra strain on the feet. Man, this is we need varying viewpoints on the show because because I'm sitting here going VR, 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 and this is a variety of just different considerations that I wouldn't even think of, you know, in terms of, uh, because because it's not my wheelhouse, but man, that's interesting, and thank you so much for sharing that that information with us, Logan, that's awesome. Um, I'm glad you at least have a, you know, perspective on, uh, from another point of view, that's, that's really cool. I'm glad I could contribute. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on here to the next one. So we had task performance. Um, uh, what's the official thing? Uh, task performance and situation awareness with a virtual reality head-mounted display. I'm going to I'm going to kind of blaze through these because we're 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 getting a little tight on time here tonight. But uh, basically, they were looking at how do we measure reality, right? So they were looking at situation awareness, task performance, and risk level within a virtual environment. Basically, what they did was they had people do a parking task in both a real environment, a flat screen, like video game like entire environment, as well as a VR world. Um, and so they, they measured things like task time, number of crashes, um, situation awareness using the SART, and then, um, you know, their maximum speed and observed risk. So basically the findings of this one was that there was no significance in, in situation awareness. They, they all knew what was going on. There was a difference in um, time taken, um, and it, it, it took a little bit more time to do it in the real and virtual environments rather than the uh, flat screen. And uh, we also saw a significant difference in um, max speed and number of crashes and risk, right? So... Obviously, the, the main takeaway that I got from this is the higher fidelity you get, the more careful you get, right? So if you're using a flat screen, you're not going to be as careful as you were using a headset. And if you're using a headset, you're not going to be as careful as doing the real thing. And it's a matter of immersion, right? That's kind of the overarching uh, theme of this one. Oh, yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, too, because the more immersed you are, especially in this case where it's something where people do in real life, I would say in VR and in real life, you would understand the consequences of crashing. But doing it like in a 2D car, I mean, it's it's basically playing a video game, like you said. So there's not as many consequences for failure. Sure, sure. Uh, OK, I'm going to keep us going here. 
The next one was the effects on the HoloLens in collaboration tasks. And uh, this one, I admittedly didn't understand probably as, as much as I could have, but I'll go over it as much as I can. So they looked at uh, the HoloLens in collaboration. So they looked at how navigation is affected by communication and collaboration while using a HoloLens. And for our listeners, the, the Microsoft HoloLens, if you're unfamiliar, is a device that you put on your head. It's an augmented reality display that projects uh, images onto the environment. So what they were doing was they did, they did three different types of projections. So they used a smartphone, a tablet, and the HoloLens as uh, varying conditions of the study. And the companion, so it'd be like what we're doing right now. So um, Blake and Logan, you're on Skype with me. And if you were trying to do a task, I'd be able to see what you are seeing and draw on the screen like, hey, check over here and draw an arrow to this. And the tasks that they were trying to do was find a book in the library. And this was composed of three different phases. So you had, a, you know, they, they had to navigate straight to the area with the books. Then they had to find the correct bookshelf. And then they had to find the correct book on the correct bookshelf. And each step of the way, someone on Skype was going, hey, you know, I think it's over here and drawing um, accordingly on a, on a companion app. The findings of this one was basically, uh, you know, using the HoloLens phase one and two, which was the straight line to the bookshelf and find correct bookshelf. Took a little bit longer, but the book took shorter. So there, there's a lot of room for potential with the HoloLens in terms of this collaboration effort. Yeah, I feel like that'd be really cognitively, cognitively overloading, right? Having people, I guess, interacting with this with your environment that that you're only experiencing, but like helping you through a task. Uh, so that that's kind of cool. I love to see how the line of research evolves from there because I know we did a story about the HoloLens a couple weeks ago and they're adding like chatbots into it. So it's only going to get like more of a immersive tech, become a more immersive technology as time goes on, especially in, in like an industrial setting. Like how long was that, that uh, chat bots to HoloLens article? Cause I feel like it was years ago. Oh uh, but yeah. Also, I think it was like two weeks it, ago. Yeah. HFES has aged me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm so tired. Oh my God. There's so much stuff going on. Uh, okay. So, Logan, do you have any other closing thoughts on that one before I move on to our last uh, – is it our last one? I think this is our last one. Yeah, this is our last one. Um, not really. The only thing I would think of to add to that one are potential applications, which for that, for that particular bit of hardware, the first things that pop into my head just hearing it just now um, are the potential military applications. I'm imagining a, almost a human Cortana sitting back at base – looking through the eyes of the soldier, pointing out threats, or maybe even potentially in the future with, say, some sort of sports where you maybe have a player who is receiving or a quarterback who's receiving real-time input from his coach over some sort of hollow lens. So just things that popped into my head as potential future design implementations of something like that. Yeah, that, those are really good points that you make. Uh especially the 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 sports i i mean i don't i'm not a sports guy but i know that the technology incorporated into sports has has exponentially grown over the years and uh you know it definitely has the resources to be able to do something like that and so yeah that'd be super interesting to see something like the hololens incorporated into football players helmets or something like that to um to kind of see to, to to yeah to get input from their coach that's that's really cool to me oh yeah that would be pretty interesting that would that might make me watch sports the more technology we involve in sports the more likely i am to watch sports all right so let's get into this last story here so this one here was um looking at 3d audio on uh, hologram localization in augmented reality right so that's a lot to unpack. So basically, they were also using the hollow localized audio uh, for, um, you know, the, the the objects that are situated around them. So the, they were talking about the difference between real audio and virtual audio and how 
the head related transfer function plays a big role in this, right? If you hear something from your right hand side, there's a delay on your left ear. Um, you hear it from your right ear first and then it goes over to your left ear. And so using this, they, they uh, wanted to apply it to the, the domain of augmented reality. And because augmented reality has a narrow field of view um, in terms of locating items or locating objects in the environment, they were looking at the um, audio solution to sort of, uh, the, they were looking at audio as a solution to localize objects that the user may be interested in. So their question was, how does audio help users or hurt users uh, localize holograms in virtual reality or augmented reality? And so what they did was they kind of put this little sphere in front of them, and it kind of played a guitar riff, which had a you know pretty big spectrum of sounds that, that the user could potentially easily identify. And um, the user would then go select the, the sphere with like a pinching motion, and uh, then the sphere would appear somewhere else and they'd have to locate it again and do the same thing. So they used a variety of stimuli uh, in varying conditions where in one condition they kind of had an arrow pointing to wherever the uh, position, to, the, to, to wherever the hologram was. Then they also had the auditory cue of you know, the, the sphere emits audio, so you would look over in that direction. And then you also had a mix, right, where you had the arrow and the audio cue. And uh, there was no significant difference with where the um, the hologram was appearing in a short distance, right? Because theoretically, you could just use your vision on that one. Uh, but when it when it became further from the last point, right, further out of your field of view, the uh, there was a significant difference with audio and visual um, cues, and that outperformed everything else. So the more cues you have, but I mean, it was it was right on par with the audio cues, which imply which would imply that you only need the auditory cues in order to localize that sound. So this one I thought was really interesting because it was more focused on the auditory aspect of virtual environments rather than the physical visual aspect of it. And uh, it, it was, it was a really great article to, uh, to, to, it was a really great presentation to listen to. Yeah. And I can imagine anything from sound design is going to be a major player in how you experience any kind of virtual reality, whether it's augmented or like through a virtual reality headset. Uh, Cause I, I mean, it could be drawing your attention to things that are out of your view purposely to like just get you to turn around or look in a different space or like it like this article is going through, just have you localize an object in a specific field of view. Um, so it's that's awesome to hear. And it's a totally different twist on what we've kind of talked about for the past two days with regard to VR. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be exciting when we finally get Human Factors cast audio localized so you can hear us from a certain direction in a virtual environment. That'd be cool. It's coming. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Logan. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Blake. Oh, I just said it's coming. I was being a goof. <laughs> hey, Logan, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before I wrap us up for tonight? Yeah, I actually have a quick question. You were talking about it. Um, the audio cues coming from outside a particular angle, is that all the way behind them? Or is it just sort of at like a, a, a little more than like a 180 degree angle? No, it was it was completely 360 degrees. So the audio cue, the, the hologram could be located at any point 360 degrees around the participant. And if they got an audio cue from behind them, then theoretically they would turn 180 degrees and, and, and uh, identify the object behind them. Okay, because when you were talking about the effectiveness of having the visual piece in with the auditory piece, I, the first thing that popped into my head was something I actually heard discussed earlier this week, which is the cone of uncertainty, which probably deserves its own episode at some point. But the whole <laughs> yeah. idea that things that are directly behind us or directly in front of us, or at particular, actually at particular angles directly to the left or right, there are some issues with determining how far away they are and exactly where they are in the environment. So that may have also played a role. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a whole other issue. And I think what they were just trying to do was how, how can we sort of use audio localization as a tool 
to get around that, right? Is it is it possible to use it? And it sounds like, you know, it helps for sure, at least in the domain of virtual environments and augmented re environments. Oh, yeah. Well, definitely, especially in a um, in the realm of virtual reality, it's probably a lot easier because the way that we actually naturally overcome the cone of uncertainty is by just moving our heads. So if the users in this in this particular experiment are able to turn their heads to localize, then they probably may have not even had that issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it'll be interesting to see where the whole field goes for that. As for that, uh, go ahead and hit that thing, Blake. Let's get out of here. <laughs> That's it for today, everyone. What do you guys think? Uh, did you like Logan's tales of the Toyota manufacturing plant? Did you like the VR sessions? I know it's it's more of the same, but uh, honestly, guys, <laughs> did you guys see something here interesting at HFES this week? Let us know. You can follow us all over social media. You can head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud, or you can send us an email at Human Factors Cast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Do that with all of your HFES 2017 Austin, Texas stories. You can also support us financially on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If uh, you don't have any money, that's okay. I understand. You can like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for being on the show today. Mr. Blake Arnstorf, where can our listeners find you? Oh, you guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. And don't forget, we also have a Slack channel, so you can go to our website and get an invite for that, and you can find me in there at all times. I wanted to thank Logan for being on the show, and Nick, again, man, thank you for working so hard and taking time out of your long days at HFES and breaking this down for me and the audience. It's been great. Oh, it's no problem at all. Mr. Logan Clark, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and talking about your experience on the Toyota factory tour plant where can our listeners find you if they want to hang out with you and talk about anything human factors related it was my pleasure nick always glad to be on uh, I, I am on linkedin at logan clark v excellent as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome thanks again for hum turning tuning into human factors cast guys until next time it depends, it depends on it depends. next year's hfes Ooh, or we might do it tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs>